Presbyterian Church here in the beautiful city of Birmingham, Alabama. I want to first give a special greeting to all of my Westminster family. I love you guys and I just can't wait to see you soon worshiping in this wonderful sacred space uh, together. Pray that you're doing well, that you're staying safe during this season of uh, staying safe at home during this coronavirus uh, epidemic. We just pray that together as a family that we will continue to stay connected continue to reach out to one another, call and, and pray for each other. Stay connected because it's by your words of encouragement and love uh, that we are held together. States are able to stay strong in this season. So I encourage you to keep reaching out to your church family. And for those of you who are not part of our family, I want to thank you for tuning in today because uh, you bless us by uh, logging in and viewing and also sharing what you see. Uh, with your family and friends by sharing the post and, and, and spreading the word of God with others who are around. So I, I want to encourage you, uh, Westminster, as well as uh, our friends who are on this page now, share the post with your family and friends so they can be blessed with what you hear as well. And I want to encourage you all in this season, continue to rejoice, for our God is great and he's greatly to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. Now we pose our hearts and minds to look to our great God, the one who we love and cherish in a moment of prayer together. It's through prayer that we're able to talk to our God and he talks to us. And as we come before him together, we cast all of our cares on him, knowing that our great God cares for us. Let us pray. Father, we magnify your holy and righteous name. For you, God, are worthy to be praised. There is none like you. God, you are a great God. You are a mighty God. You are a holy God. And we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Thank you, Father, for another opportunity that you've given us to come together and worship online, in our homes, wherever we may be at this point in time. God, we focus our all on you. For you are worthy, O oh God, of our praise. We thank you, God, for provisions of food, clothing, and shelter for watching over us and bringing us to another day, beginning of a new month, the month of May. For that, we thank you for all that this month presents for us being used for your purposes, spreading the kingdom of God, reaching out to our family and friends, and sharing your precious love to be your instrument of compassion, and peace, and strength, and salvation in this world. So God, I pray that you'll use us to your fullest capacity. Transform our hearts, make us one with you. That our words will be in line with your will. That our actions will be in line with your desire to touch and heal, to bring forth comfort and strength and encouragement. Use us to that great end. And Father, I pray for all who are listening to my voice who may be sick in their bodies, God, we know that you're Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. And so, God, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, touch their bodies, provide healing of mind, body, and soul. And, Father, as we continue to grow and go through this season, we ask, God, that you would give us a solid trust in you, 
unwavering in the midst of this uneasy time, that our faith will be held strong as we trust in you. For God, you are unwavering. You are solid. So God, we put all of our faith and trust in you. Have your way in our lives. Be glorified in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, I want to begin reading in verse 20 and read to the end, verse 25. 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in him. Now that you are purified yourselves by obeying truth, you that, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is a word that was preached to you. Verse 20 one says, through him you believe in God. Believe in God. I want to talk in this title, Believing in God. Believing in God. Believing in God. We, we talk the language of belief in God. It's part of our language as Christians. We believe in God. We're believers. In fact, Timothy Wright wrote a song several years ago, the late great songwriter. He said these words, I'm a believer. Yes, I'm a believer. Yes, I'm a believer. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. He's a giver of all life. From heaven he came down, oh, what joy I found. No, you were not there. You don't know when or where. But what the Lord's done for me, he's gave me the victory. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Say yes, I'm a believer. Believing in our great God is the beginning for all of us to start of a new life. The movement from darkness to light. Believing in God transforms our life and our relationships so that we have a life that now is given to the eternal praise of our great God. Believing in God. Believing in God. And as we read this text, we realize and understand along with other passages of scripture that our first step of belief was not because of us, but was because of God. Our great God who created heaven and earth. He and his mind had the salvation of mankind, of humanity, in his mind. I want you to understand this. The scripture teaches us this and tell it to teach us that God's choice of the Son before time gave us a choice in time. God's choice of the Son before time, his S-O-N, gave us a choice in time. Verse 20 says these words. He was chosen before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last times for your sake. God, before time began, before God said, let there be, before all of the earth and all of the the fish in the sea and the, the birds of the air, before mankind took their first breath, God had in his mind sending his son to die for you and for me. 
Hmm. What a thought that causes pause and awe. Such love that God, before time began, thought about and had it on his mind that I'm going to provide a way through my son that all of creation, all of mankind will be able to come to me. Before time began, God planned to sacrifice his son for our salvation. John, in his revelation, Revelation 13, verse 8, he describes Jesus as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Peter was standing and preaching on that day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2. He was talking about Jesus Christ. And as he was speaking to the Jews and those who were there listening in that audience, he says these words in Acts chapter 2, verse 23 about Jesus. It says, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. That Jesus' death, him going to the cross, him dying, was part of God's set purpose and foreknowledge. It was not an accident. It was part of God's providence that he had in his mind before time began that Jesus would die to save you and me. What a wonderful thought to hold on to, to grab on to as believers that our God had us on his mind before the beginning of time. Wow. God had a choice. And that choice was to select his son so that the son would give his life so that you and I would be able to enter into the family of God. What a wonderful privilege we have in being part of the family of God because of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the choice that he made before creation, and he revealed it in these last times for your sake. He's speaking to the believers for your sake, believers, for our sake. The revelation of Jesus Christ coming, born of the Virgin Mary, living a sinless life, going to the cross, dying for our sins, and raised the third day with all power in his hands. That revelation came in our time. So that what God had ordained before time began, now he reveals it in time, in our time, so that we would hear and believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that Jesus ascended to the Father, and that he's coming back. So putting our faith in him was made possible through the revelation of God. So my salvation, your salvation, the salvation of whosoever will hear is based on the fact of God's revelation for our sake to save us from a place called hell, a separation from God where the power and presence and love of God are devoid, where there's only punishment. But he provided a rescue plan to redeem lost man, to bring us into his family through his son. Oh, what a privilege it is. What a wonderful knowledge and thought it is that God's choice of the Son before time gave us a choice in time. So we're able to make a choice by hearing the word and being saved today eternally. But this also gives us the assurance that this creator God who's in control of all things, as we live our day in the midst of this crazy pandemic, a time that seems so, so mind-blowing and baffling, confusing, stirring up all sorts of emotions, going up and down and vacillating between fear and not knowing what to do. It, it can 
take the, over our very thoughts. But this thought that our God sees all, knows all, and is here in the midst of all we're going through. So that when we're going through this present time that's uncertain and causing fear to swell up, we can stand assured that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound man. We can stand assured that we can put our trust in him in this present time. For he said that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Hallelujah. Amen. God's choice of the son before time gave us a choice in time. And when we're faced with circumstances that challenge us right now, we can put our trust in him in time, knowing that he's with us and he'll never forsake us. But also, the text teaches us that God's choice of his son gave us a relationship with God the Father. God's choice of his son gave us a relationship with God the Father. The text says in verse 21, it says, through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, so your faith and hope are in God. Through God's Son, we are believers. Through Jesus Christ, God's only Son, we are believers in God the Father. He sent his son so to provide a pathway into our relationship with God. And we are believers. Believers in God. Now I said the title of this message is Believing in God. Yes, that's what we do. But I want to pose this alternative title, we're believers in God. Believers in God. For it's not just what we do, it's who we are. We're transformed. We, we are, are, are made anew. We are believers in God. And our belief is based on the facts that Peter lifts up here in this text that sets our faith, our hope in God apart from anything else. One, he says that because of this Jesus Christ, he says, who, verse 21, raised, God raised him from the dead. This theme, this, this, this Christian doctrine of the resurrection is central to our faith. And here, Peter lifts it up, it's because that God the Father raised God the Son from the dead we are believers. We put our faith, our hope, and our trust in God because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Essential. That's why all the gospel writers, all four, emphasize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul, in writing his epistle, uh, emphasized the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 emphasized that there was over 500 witnesses and those believers that were there that saw the resurrected Lord for themselves. And he, he emphasized how important the resurrection is for our faith. If Jesus did not, was not raised from the dead, our faith and our preaching is in vain. Beloved, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have the assurance that just as Jesus died and was raised by the Father, we too one day, when we die, we will be raised again. But that brings also an application even for our current living of these days. Just as Christ died and was raised from the dead, we die to sin's control and we're raised to the newness of life. And so therefore, because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that is resident and present in our lives, he gives us power to live a life where we, each day, as we grow by faith, we sin less. That sin has no longer shackled us and holds us as slaves, but we are free 
in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to live victorious lives. It is through the power of the resurrection that we're able to live lives that bring honor and glory to our great God. Peter also goes on to say, there in verse 21, we believe in, in God because he raised Jesus from the dead, but he also glorified him. Glorified him. Has ideas pointing to what happened after his resurrection. He was raised from the dead. He walked and revealed himself to men over 40 days. And then the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, tells us or illustrates to us a story, a uh, part of the story of the life of Jesus Christ, where he was taken up on a cloud in the sight of the believers, the disciples, to heaven. His ascension to heaven. He ascends on a cloud. And the angel says, behold, this Jesus who you see, he's going to come back again. So, so with the ascension as part of his glory, being glorified, he goes back he sits at the right hand of the Father, but before he sits down, there's a, a revelation. There is a presentation. The presentation of his nail-pierced hands and feet and his pierced side. Those scars in his resurrected body now go to heaven. And those scars are part of the glory that God bestows. Why? Because here Jesus came, born of a Virgin Mary, wrapped in flesh like man, but not sinning like man. Who, at the end of his time, his life was declared holy, blameless, without sin. And he died at a perfect sacrifice and in this body, he takes him. The Father takes him back to heaven, to the heavenly altar to show to God, it's done, it's finished. The perfect sacrifice has been made, and there at the altar of God, Jesus presents his body as a first and last and final sacrifice for all of the sins of mankind. Oh, what glory. I can imagine all the angels shouting for glory for the great work that he's done. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father where he's making intercession for you and for me. What a glorious position our God has because of his great sacrifice. Beloved, we understand these truths. We understand these teachings about the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ from this great book. And as we study this book, our faith grows. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, and we are transformed by the word of God. And that's what Peter shifts our attention to as he lets us understand this fact that God's word birthed us into this new relationship with God the Father. God's word birthed us into this new relationship with God the Father. Verses 22 through 25 in verse 23, I want to emphasize this, these words, says verse 23, for you have been born again. You have been born again. Born once physically, now born again spiritually. What's the agent of the birth? The text says, not by the perishable seed or imperishable, uh, imperishable, but through the living, enduring word of God. The living, enduring word of God. He emphasized that the way that we are born again, brought into the family of God, when we come into the place of becoming believers, is by the word of God. This word is eternal. He emphasized that here in this passage. We're using these words of imperishable, enduring. In verse 25, it says, the word of, Lord, of the Lord shall stand forever. The word of God is eternal. It's eternal. No end. 
How can that be? It's, it's not just these words that are in black and white, or uh, black and white, and, and but also in some red in some of our Bibles to denote the words of Jesus. It's not just this. For John emphasized to us that the understanding of the word is much more than that. It says this in John chapter 1, verse 1, as he speaks about Jesus Christ. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was of God, and the word was with God. Speaking of Jesus Christ, in the beginning. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And so John draws from that very image of creation. And he links it together. That Jesus is the eternal word. That Jesus is God and that his eternal nature and the word are connected together. And beloved, he is the source of our salvation. He is the source of our keeping our lives together. He is the one in whom we trust, and he's decided to give us his word, his written word, which embodies and reveals to us the eternal word himself. For our faith, transform our lives through the eternal word of God. We are born again. The text goes on to say, by, by the word of God we are changed. Verse 22. We are changed. It's now that you have been purif you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. The truth is the word so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. The Word of God changes us. We're changed by the Word of God. The text says that we're purified. We're purified by obeying the Word of God. Purified, purified. The idea is that we are made morally right in the presence of God. He, by, obey, by giving us the Word, and we obey the Word of God, there's an exchange that happens. He takes our thoughts that are outside of God's will and he gives us an implanted word inside of us as we obey his word. Our thoughts that are not in line with God's purposes and will for our lives that, that are contrary to the bounds of this Bible, obeying the truth of this word starts to kick out foreign thoughts, those enemies that, that fight against the will and purposes of God. As we obey, we take the enemy within captive and cast him out. Through obedience, the following faithfully the word of God, and therefore we are changed morally. We now can act in this way doing the right thing. Moral, doing the right thing. Our thoughts, as God looks at us, our thoughts become more like his thoughts. David said it this way in Psalm 119, that verse 11, Thy words have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee, O God. It's the, the word coming in, taking control, and kicking out anything that will cause us to sin, to violate the will and purposes of God. And the writer also mentions and drives home this fact in Psalm 119, verse 9, he asked this question. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? The response is, by living according to your word. And beloved, that's how you and I are able to, to stay in a place of purity and walking before God in holiness is by obeying the word of God. So the word of God changes us morally, but also the word of God changes us relationally. Notice the relational change that happens when we obey the word of God. It says in verse 22, so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. Relationally, we 
Now, through our obedience to the word of God, we're being purified, and that word begins to transform our hearts so that we love with a sincere love, meaning that we're not hypocrites. We're not fake and phony. We say one thing, we do another. But no, what I say with in your face, behind your back, I'm saying and doing the same thing out of a love that's sincere, a pure love. And the Bible says this love is seen in a way that I treat you as my brother and my sister. Brotherly love. It's a love that, that I have a kinship with you because of our relationship uh, we have together in Christ Jesus. You're my brother. You're my sister. And I treat you as such. My older uh, saints, I treat you as my mother and my father. I treat you, my younger uh, uh, brothers and sisters, as my children, my sons and my daughters. And your family. And I treat you with that same familiar love. And that's part of what God calls us to do. But he also pushes us a little further. And he says in the text that love one another deeply from the heart. This idea of deeply has with it a, a intensity, a straining. That you're going out of your way to give more of yourself than you're taking. It's giving your all. I remember my coach would always say, when you get out on that field, give your all. Don't leave nothing out there. So don't leave nothing, uh, don't leave that field without leaving everything out there. I didn't understand what that meant. I, I really understood it. Sad to say, my last game playing football in high school. This was our opportunity to go to the playoffs, and I'm a senior. And this is the last possible game that we could ever win a state championship. So I played my heart out. I mean, I was reckless. I was playing defensive end. I gave myself all, every play, every play. At the end of that game, we lost. I shared my tears. But my body ached like it never ached before. Now, I've had some aches because of being hit. But that was a different ache. I gave my all in well, and I gave my all because I, I, I knew the end was coming. I gave it all. You heard this term before, love till it hurts. God wants us to love till it hurts. To, to give our all in such a way that, that you can say, I gave my all, I gave my best because of the love I received from God. I share it with my brothers and sisters. We, we love deeply. We love deeply. Just as our God has loved us. John's gospel says this about love. John 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone would know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And then finally, Peter emphasized that this message that we've received in the word of God, it came through the foolishness of preaching. The end of verse 25. It says, by this word that was preached to you, this word, this word, which stands forever, this word was proclaimed and was preached through the gospel, through the proclamation of these holy and sacred words. And I want to challenge us all and myself as believers, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. The message that we proclaim is not a message that comes from uh, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal. It's good information to read to know about what's going on in the world, but the message that we proclaim is from the Word of God. We proclaim it because it's the source of salvation. It's the source of how lives are changed. It's the source that brings us into the family of God. Beloved, don't you want others to come to the same place where you are? Don't you want people to be brought into the family of God? As 
It is in this day. We're challenged with so many things. But we want people to know that they can stand on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises reign. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit's sword. Standing on the promises, I shall not fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior, who's my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Believing in God is standing on the promises, knowing that you cannot fall, that through all of the storms of doubt and fear, you're able to stand strong on the word of God. Oh, believer, stand on the word of God. Amen. Amen. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to join us at the sacred table. We encourage you to take a moment and grab your cup and uh, grab your bread so that we can come together around the Lord's table. Know that we are not physically here, but spiritually we link together in fellowship, in communion at the Lord's table. Our great God encouraged us and said to us that we should do this in remembrance of him on a regular basis. And so out of honor, out of this wonderful privilege that God has given us to come at the table and be in fellowship with him, we prepare our hearts and minds as we pray together over the, the cup and the bread. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the wonderful privilege you give us to commune with you at this holy table. We thank you for the cup that represents your blood that was shed. We thank you for the bread that represents your body that was broken. It's because of this sacrifice of your life that we're able to be part of the family of God. We know that your sacrifice paid the debt for all of our sins and that you died and you were raised from the dead so that we can die to sin's control and to rise up and walk in a newness of life. And as we come around this table, it's a reminder of that sacrifice, but also the freedom 
and liberty that we've received through Jesus Christ. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. Now bless the bread in the cup for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On that evening, Jesus with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he blessed it in their presence. And he took the bread and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take Saving life, his life was given for all of us. For all of eternity, we're saved, we're believers in Jesus Christ. God bless you.
Father, we thank you for blessing us with this time together as we worship your holy and righteous name. God, we pray that we will become doers of your holy and righteous word. Father, allow us to give a cool cup of water in the loving name of Jesus Christ, to share a hug, a handshake, a phone call, a smile, with someone who needs to experience your encouragement, to experience your love. But most importantly, God, use us to be bearers of your word, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with some man, woman, boy, or girl, so they will come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and be brought into the family of God. Use us to that end. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to our great God be glory, honor, and praise. Hallelujah. Amen.